king, comforter, spirit of truth, art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasury of good things, and giver of life. Come and dwell within us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Hey, welcome back to Reason and Theology. I'm your host, Michael. On a Tuesday morning, we're talking about the traditional Latin Mass, um, the world over on EWTN. Peter Kwasniewski, I believe, is how I've heard people pronounce it, although in the past I've pronounced it Kwasniewski, but I think it's Kwasniewski. Um, and also Cardinal uh, Welton Gregory, who has... Um, uh, you know, recently made some unfortunate decisions in his diocese, which, um, you know, I totally understand people who um, would, would hmm, what's the words I'm looking for, would respond in a way that is going to give some pushback. I could totally understand. I admire people who want to see good liturgies in the Roman Rite. I'm all for that. I admire people who will give some pushback to individuals like um, Cardinal Gregory. However, it needs to be done in a charitable way, in a way that's consistent with um, canon law and the prescriptions of the church. So it needs to be done in, in the way that is conducive for holiness and sanctity not in a way that produces schism. Um, but I admire those who want to see the Roman Rite restored to its beauty. Um, I admire those who want to see the Novus Ordo in the way that it's generally celebrated, elevated. Um, because again, frankly, in the way that the Novus Ordo tends to be celebrated, uh, feet on the ground. It's it's certainly not what the Second Vatican Council called for. It's it's not even with the rubrics that Paul the Sixth and the Third Edition of the Roman Missal by Benedict the Sixteenth call for. It's it's often done in a way that deviates significantly from that. Um, and I think that's unfortunate, very unfortunate. So I really admire those who are working to see the Roman Rite restored to the dignity that it deserves. I, I'm not necessarily saying that what has been promulgated um, is bad, but I certainly think that the way that it is often celebrated needs some serious, serious work. So I admire those who are doing it. However, I, I have some concerns about the way that some people are trying to go about restoring the Roman Rite. Um, in the way that it's practically celebrated. I, I want to use Peter Kwasniewski as an example of how not to respond to bishops who restrict the Latin Mass. Um, and this is not meant as a personal attack against Peter. This is me interacting with his views. I think a lot of people, as I've said before, often confuse the difference between criticism of one's views and criticism of the person. They're not the same thing. Um, I'm not criticizing Peter as a person or his motives or his intentions. I'm sure his intentions are good. They're to see the Roman right celebrated properly. Uh, I'm sure that's what his intentions are. So I, I, I assume they're good and I don't have a reason to believe otherwise. So I'm not attacking his, his person. But I do want to challenge his views and what he's expressing and what we're about to see. And I want to say this is not the way to go. So I'm calling a brother in Christ to a different path. And I'm also calling everybody else who would follow his views here to a different path, to a different approach. Uh, hoping that they will realize that taking the approach we're about to see is not helpful it's counterintuitive. Um, it's not going to bring about the accomplishments that they're wanting to bring about. It's going to do the exact opposite. So my comments are aimed at helping those who want to see the Roman Rite restored, those who want to see it celebrated in a proper way. I'm going to provide an alternative 
and I'm going to say this is not the way. And it seems like a lot of people are in agreement with what we're about to see from Kwasniewski, and that's very disturbing. And I, and again, I hope to charitably call those brothers in Christ to a different path. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to watch a clip from uh, Raymond Arroyo's The World Over on EWTN, which was shown on July 28th, 2022. And he's commenting on uh, Wilton Gregory's Restrictions of the Tridentine Mass in his territory. It seems that he's going from 21 locations that will have the Tridentine Mass to now eight, which is certainly unfortunate. Um, however, I'm a little envious of you all in, in, in his territory who have access even to eight TLMs. I wish I had access to just one. Um, Closest to me is about three hours away. Um, so I'm a little envious of y'all to find out that y'all have that many still. <laughs> However, I, I understand that going from 21 to 8 and then five of them not actually celebrated in a parish, if I if I recall correctly. I totally understand that's that's a move in the wrong direction. Um, I, I think that it, it should be a move in a very different direction. However, it needs to be done for the right reasons. Um, so if, if there's an increase in tried NT masses, I think that that's actually a good thing because that's going to help, um, impact and influence Novus Ordos in the way that they're celebrated. Um, although I do want to see the motives for the increases in the tried NT mass to not be something that derives from a schismatic mentality, one that is against the conciliar reforms and against Paul the Six and against the Novus Ordo, but rather one that is going to be there to help bring and um, help reform the Novus Ordo. I think that would be a good thing. So <clears throat> I think it's unfortunate to go from 21 to 8. Um, again, I think that Cardinal Gregory going in the wrong direction. Uh, so we, we need to certainly... We need to certainly be able to express ourselves and express those things um, and, and challenge our bishops by making our needs known. But we have to do it in a way that is respectful to their office um, <clears throat> and one that it would also not confirm their fears. And I'm going to show why there is a um, clamping down on the... TLM and why Kwasniewski's reaction is just going to confirm them. It's just going to make them think, you know what, we did right to restrict the TLM. Um, and that's the wrong approach. What we need to do is show the shepherds, no, we're not the way uh, that you have described us. We're not schismatics. Uh, we're not fostering a schismatic mentality. We're going to prove you wrong there. We're going to show you charitably and lovingly that we recognize your authority and we're going to be obedient to you, um, yet we're going to continue to make our needs known. Um, that will speak volumes to our shepherds rather than what we're about to see. So again, this is something from Kwasniewski on the world over around the four-minute uh, timestamp. I'm going to share my screen, enable audio. Please let me know if y'all cannot hear it. Let's listen to some comments from Kwasniewski on this situation. With Catholics, even who find the old right uh, spiritually nourishing and fulfilling and, uh, and, and, dy and, and um, dynamic for their, their, li their life of faith, it's almost as if the, the attitude is you either must learn to love and worship with this new right it, it doesn't matter what your personal experiences are uh or tough luck um you know we're going to impose uh, a new set of jim crow laws and we're going to force uh, segregation of catholics into separate but unequal categories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well um <clears throat> i think it's completely unhelpful to use this kind of rhetoric of comparing Gregory Wilton's actions to the Jim Crow laws. This is what's going to discredit anybody who is trying to promote good liturgies in the Roman Rite. Whenever we start telling a cardinal, you know what, your actions are reminiscent of the Jim Crow laws, 
that's going in the wrong direction. That's taking the wrong approach. And that's, that's exactly what is going to confirm them and their suspicions and their fears. This is exactly why they're restricting VTLM because of behavior like that. It would be more constructive to leave that kind of rhetoric and those kinds of insults out of this discussion and to just simply deal with why it is important to have the Trident team mass in the Roman right right now and why it's important not to restrict it. Rather than appealing to this kind of rhetoric that is incredibly offensive to many people, and rightly so. Now, I know there's some people that are offended by things that, you know what, if the gospel is a stumbling block and an offense to you, so be it. But this is one of those unnecessary offenses uh, to compare his actions to Jim Crow laws. Moreover, I mean, the issue of this being the difference between an old right and a new right, I think Kwasniewski is, is wrong there. <clears throat> he, he certainly seems to have <clears throat> a deficient understanding of the Roman right. Um, and so he, he sees the two as, you know, two different rights. They're not the same Roman right. And, um, uh, among some other deficiencies with his view, uh, that I've criticized elsewhere. And again, those criticisms isn't an attack on the person, but it's, um, criticisms of his views, but we'll, we'll leave that there. So we, because this would end up turning into a whole, a whole nother show criticizing his views on how he understands the Roman right and what his vision is for how to reform it. But again, I'm all in favor of those who want to see reform in the Roman right. I'm just, I'm concerned about the way that we go about expressing ourselves. Now, <clears throat> somebody brought this, their concerns to Kwasniewski's attention. They were they thought that it was incredibly inappropriate to criticize Gregory Wilton on grounds that his actions are like the Jim Crow laws and segregation in the United States. Some people rightly so recognize that um, <clears throat> that's going too far. And so um, unfortunately, Kwasniewski has not only doubled down, but tripled down on this. Um, so he, he hasn't backed off from that. And again, I think that's unfortunate because this is not the approach. This is not the way to go about to bring reform in the Roman, right? I think this is the way that is just simply going to confirm people like Gregory Wilton uh, or Wilton Gregory, I should say, it's going to confirm them in their uh concerns about people who tend to frequent the tlm and so uh what's going to happen is good people who frequent the tlm are going to be lumped in with um you know the mentality that um we saw expressed here and I, again i think that's unfortunate so <clears throat> Let's see what he says in response to the criticisms. This was uh, posted by Kwasniewski. Last night I was on the world over again, this time with Chad Pecknold. I received an irate email from a gentleman in England who wrote, quote, I have some sympathy for people who attend the TLM, but your insensitive comments on EWTN comparing Cardinal Wilton Gregory's clampdown on TLM with Jim Crow laws were particularly crass, especially when the Cardinal is an African American. This kind of intemperate language does nobody any favors. I suggest you contact Raymond at EW10 and send an apology to be read on air. Are you seriously comparing the US version of uh, apathide with no, I'm sorry, with not being able to attend a Latin mass when um, apartheid, sorry. Uh, with not being able to attend a lap mass where there are still three places you can attend Holy Mass. I, I think it's actually um, eight, eight locations, but three of them are going to be in the parish, if I recall correctly. So it's, it's not three, it's, it should be eight. Um, but I understand some are concerned that, okay, but the location of those five is, is not ideal. That, that's certainly understandable, that, that concern. Um, <clears throat> So Kwasniewski says, my reply to him, which I share now in case anyone else thinks uh, to make the same, 
I made my remark quite deliberately because his eminence, though what a lowly eminence. See, I think that that's, that's the kind of approach that's not helpful. I think that my brother in Christ, um, Peter, I, I think that with all due respect, you, you need to take a different approach. It's comments like that that are going to um, harm your cause rather than help your cause. It, and and so I, I don't I don't think that that's appropriate. I think you should take a different approach, a more charitable approach. Because his eminence, though what a lowly eminence, is black. He of all men should know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of a prejudice based on lazy assumptions and flat out errors. Um, so of course he's he's now saying that. Um, Pope Francis and Traditionis Custodis and also the Cardinal are guilty of lazy assumptions and flat out errors. In fact, what he and bishops like him have done to their own brethren in the faith is worse than the Jim Crow laws, because those at least pretend to create separate and equal facilities, whereas the following tradition loving Catholics have been given separate but unequal facilities kicked out of parishes which may die because of the departure, shoved off to, and sorry, the rest of it is cut off, but I think you get the point. Um, my brother, this is not the way. This is not the way. Um, this is counterintuitive. This is not the way. With all due respect and, and with charity, please turn away from this. Uh, drop the rhetoric, drop the insults, and just stick to the facts. Stick to the points. Stick to the reasons why we should see the Roman right um, flourish. Why should we should see the Roman right celebrated better? Um, drop the rhetoric. All of that is just going to confirm people who already have biases against those who frequent the TLM. And I do think that some of those biases are unfair, but then some of those biases are confirmed by this kind of behavior. One more point before I turn to some of the reasons why they have these biases. Again, Kwasniewski doubles or triples down. He says, glad to see others like Kenneth Wolf are thinking along the same lines. In my EWTN interview last night, I said Gregory was implementing a new form of Jim Crow law. And so he goes on to talk about that. And again, mentions September 8th, 2022, the current 21 locations where the traditional Latin mass is currently offered in the diocese of 70 parishes will be largely suppressed and eight locations will be permitted. Three of them are fortunate enough to have the TLM in the parish church, uh, which is odd because I thought that Traditionis Custodis restricted it being done in a parish church. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Albeit, although I'm all in favor of it being done in a parish church, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I, I'm not sure how that lines up uh, with Traditionis Custodis. But let, let's not tell Gre let's not tell Wilton Gregory. <laughs> Albeit with restrictions and expected indoctrination. Um more more rhetoric there but the other five will be gymnasiums and other places separated from a main uh parish church i don't know if that's factually true I, I would have to go and confirm that but that's at least what he's reporting however reliable his reporting is it may or may not be reliable i don't know um <clears throat> again this is not the way this is not the way tripling down on this kind of rhetoric not the way and again, it is confirming them in the very reason why Traditionis Custodis was released. I want to show something to you. Uh, let me pull it up here on my screen. <laughs> okay. This is one of the reasons why Traditionis Custodis was implemented. And I've criticized this document charitably. Um, I think that Traditionis Custodis is probably not timely. And I don't think that it's it takes the most prudent measures to deal with some of the concerns that the Holy Father has. Um, I think that there was another way that the Holy Father could have handled this. But then again, you know what? 
history might prove him right. And maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. We'll see how history uh, backs this thing up. Um, Paul Francis, however, tells us why he's taking these very, very large measures to restrict the TLM. Um, and this is partly why you're seeing people like Cardinal Gregory implementing Traditionis Custodis in the way that it's done. Again, I'm not saying I agree with um, Gregory, um, Cardinal Gregory. I'm not even saying that I'm in full agreement with the disciplinary measures that Pope Francis has taken. Although I, I certainly respect his office and, and I know he has good intentions and goodwill. But I would just simply question whether or not this was the most effective way to deal with the concerns that he has. Um, if this, you know, if this really will accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. But here's his motives. A final reason for my decision is this. Ever more plain in the words and attitudes of many is the close connection between the choice of celebrations according to the liturgical books prior to Vatican II in the rejection of the church and her institutions in the name of what is called the true church. Um, if you've look, if you look further into Kwasniewski's perspective, I think that this really does describe him. So I think that what Pope Francis is criticizing is individuals like Kwasniewski. Um, however, they would not necessarily phrase it this way. If I, I would argue, if you continue to just listen to what they're advocating, this is what Pope Francis is trying to clamp down on. Um, so what Pope Francis is trying to deal with is people who are using the TLM as a point of departure and dissent from the magisterium and also the Second Vatican Council. Um, we could read the, the rest of the paragraph, but... Um, I think you get the gist here of what Pope Francis is trying to engage among some of his other concerns. Now, we might say, okay, but I think that we can deal with people who are are using the TLM in a way to be in dissent from the magisterium. I think that we can deal with them without the measures of restrictions that are adopted in Traditionis Custodis. Fair enough. Fair enough. Because there's a lot of people who frequent the TLM who don't have a schismatic mentality and don't and are not in um, dissent from the magisterium and are not being uncharitable. But they're going to be the ones who suffer because of people who are what we just saw here from Pope Francis, what he described. And my concern is with the kind of behavior that we saw and the kind of response that we saw from Kwasniewski. And it's not unique to him. If you go to his social media and look at the comments, you'll see how many people agreed with him. Um, my concern is that approach is just going to make Pope Francis and people like Cardinal Gregory confirmed in their decisions. It's just going to make them feel like, well, we were right. What would be better is to be charitable to Cardinal Gregory. Um, and also, at the same time, to make your needs known, as canon law says. To do it in a way that's charitable, cognizant of his office, without comments like what a lowly eminence and stuff like that. That's against what Canon 212 tells us. Express your needs. Make them known to your shepherds, but do it in a charitable way. And I'm telling you, if, if Cardinal Gregory saw that our responses to this were not schismatic in the way that I'm seeing some people on social media behaving, if he, he didn't see those kinds of reactions, but he saw a group of people who are holy, respectful, reverent, and charitable, that might seriously make him have to re-question his decision here. But if all we're going to do is show him uncharitable words, uncharitable behavior, schismatic mentalities and attitudes, which I'm seeing often on social media, it's just going to confirm them. And you might say, but they're, they're wrong. Okay, 
prove them wrong. But what I'm saying right now is we're proving them right. And that's unfortunate. So I'm going to say this is not how we, we need to behave. What we need to do is take a better approach. How would the saints react here? Unfortunately, I know some individuals like Kwasniewski are going to appeal to some circumstances in history where the saints reacted in a way that he thinks is consistent with the way he's acting here. Um, I, I don't agree. Um, I think that he's unintentionally misrepresenting the situations, but I know that he would respond to this by saying, but the saints would react this way. And no, that's not how the saints would react. Um, and that's unfortunate because again, this is just confirming people like Gregory, w Wilton Gregory and, and their perception and Pope Francis and their perception of people who frequent the TLM. It's again, very unfortunate because there's really good people that would frequent them. Um, like I said, I mean, the closest one to me is about three hours, but if there was one nearby, I'd go there, you know, pretty often. Um, you know, just as I would to a, a good Novus Ordo that's being done properly. I, I would certainly support both of those. Um, so there would be a lot of people attending these things that have good motives and are not uncharitable and are not, you know, teaching things that are schismatic. They're getting lumped in with some other people. It's unfortunate. Um, let me see what is going on in the chat. I think the criticisms seen in TD are fair. What's TD? I think you might mean Traditionis Custodis. Again, um, look, it's it's what Pope Francis is saying is true, but my concern is, again, with all due respect to, to the Holy Father, my concern is, but is Traditionis Custodis the way to deal with this? Is that the best way? I, I just I, I can think of some other ways to deal with people who are schismatics without taking the measures of traditionis custodis. It, it kind of it's like it, it's a little too it's overkill, I think. Um there would be other ways to deal with problems like that without requiring a restriction of the TLM. For example, um you could have at the very least priests who are saying the TLM um, sign off on the profession of faith that John Paul II gave along with some additional clauses that can be added to it that address that concern. Um, and you could even have, um, as far as laity, you could even have something like this read before or after the liturgy. I don't know. It's just a thought. I mean, there, there's a million other examples that I could think of that would deal with a schismatic mentality without restricting the TLM. I mean, it, it just seems like there's other ways that we could go about addressing schismatic mentalities without, again, overkill and, and restricting the, the TLM. Um. Let's see. I go to the TLM, but don't identify as rad trad. Yeah, right. I mean, there's there's plenty of people who go to the Tridentine liturgy who don't share, um, you know, some of the more schismatic attitudes that we've seen. And and what about those people and their needs? How are we, how are we taking their needs into account? Um. One might say, well, I mean, they have the Novus Ordo. Well, okay. Um, if the Novus Ordo was being celebrated properly, yeah, that would be a good alternative. However, in many cases, it's not being celebrated properly, which is why they end up finding themselves at a TLM parish. So the solution here would be to fix the, <laughs> the Novus Ordo. I mean, um, frankly, if we fixed the way the Novus Ordo is celebrated, the vast majority of this problem would disappear overnight. Um, you, you, most of the people who are in dissent against Vatican II, who are in dissent against the Novus Ordo, the concerns would be gone. And so most people wouldn't be in dissent any longer. 
um, you wouldn't see that kind of schismatic mentality. I mean, to me, that might be the most effective way to address the schismatic mentality in the TLM is to repair the way the Novus Ordo is celebrated. Now, in fairness to Pope Francis, he he tries to repair the way the Novus Ordo is celebrated by calling people who are celebrating the Novus Ordo and Traditionis Custodis to better liturgies. My problem with that is it's not enough to just call people to celebrate Novus Ordos. It's not good enough. Um, whenever we take measures against people in the TLM, that's actually putting teeth behind the problem. And my question is, why aren't we putting teeth behind bad Novus Ordos? You know, it's, it's again, it's not good enough to just say, hey, please stop liturgical abuses in the Novus Ordo. That hasn't worked hasn't worked since the post uh, the post conciliar era began if that worked we would not be in this situation just simply calling people to do the right thing doesn't work you have to put teeth behind it and i'm just not seeing enough disciplinary measures against those who are abusing the novus ordo but again if if we fix that 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 would probably take care of these issues um so i mean there there's plenty of options there's plenty of ways in which we could address this without taking some of the measures of traditionis custodis but again i might be wrong it could be that the holy father was right here um it could be that he's taking things into account that i'm not um ultimately history is going to determine what the right approach would have been um so Brad says, I disagree, Michael. I don't know that the TLM people with most, with their most vocal minority will be satisfied with anything that resembles Nova, Nova Sordo. Your Some people would, would not be satisfied. I'm, I'm not saying it would fix everyone, but the majority is what I'm saying. The majority, not everyone, the majority. The majority of people who have concerns about the Nova Sordo, if the Nova Sordo was being done properly, those concerns would disappear for most people. I'm not saying it would fix everybody. The people it wouldn't fix have deeper problems. Um, so a commenter says, I agree. So many abuses in the Novus Ordo, it's very difficult to find a reverent Novus Ordo. Again, I understand. I understand the difficulty. And if it were easier to find that, again, I think that would solve a lot of problems overnight, which is why I've often just said the vast majority of the problems in the church would be fixed if we started enforcing church discipline. The vast majority of problems, wayward clergy, scandalous clergy, bad liturgies, uh, heretical theology being taught from the pulpit. If we just enforce church discipline, the vast majority of that would disappear. I think the, the post-conciliar crisis boils down to not bad uh, theology from the magisterium or harmful decrees from the magisterium, but a lack of enforcing church discipline. Um, somebody says you can never satisfy extremists on both ends. Right. I'm not saying that you could satisfy every extremist, but what I am saying is the most people who would frequent the TLM would be satisfied by that. Um, Let's see. Freynek says, not true. Nova Sordo slowly changing the faith. It's visible in Poland much. Reverence in Nova Sordo leads to better form. So the so to TLM. Um, respectfully, I think that you're wrong that the Nova Sordo is changing the faith. And I, I would simply challenge that perspective um, in light of previous videos. Maybe go and watch my Magisterium playlist and my Liturgy playlist. I think that that's, that's not true, what you're saying. And I, again, I think that your perspective would then end, end up having certain implications on the magisterium that would lead you outside of the church. Um, what else we got in the chat? Mm. Uh, let's see. How should we discuss the matter with family members falling into Kwasniewski's way of thinking? My parents have been rage posting on Facebook since our bishop started to clamp down on sacraments. Well, again, that's maybe point out to them that that's just going to confirm the cardinal and others in their suspicions about people in the TLM. So how about we show them differently? How about we show them that we're charitable people who love uh, who, who love the church and we love those 
um, who hold office in the church, even if we don't agree with some of the things they do, we we respect the office and we're not in dissent and we're not schismatics. And how about we show them that rather than showing them rage posting? Isn't that just going to confirm them and their suspicions? Sadly, it will. Um, the Novus Ordo isn't changing the faith. It's bad priests and bad catechesis that is changing the faith. I think that there's some truth to what you're saying. Certainly some truth to that. So what's the solution? Uh, returning to TLM only? No. Um, the solution would be to enforce church discipline. As I keep saying, you know, I'm going to continue to say that's the that's at the heart of the post conciliar crisis. It goes back to this well intentioned um, expression of John the 23rd, and that is to use the medicine of mercy as opposed to excommunication. He was well intentioned there, um, but I think in retrospect, that wasn't the best approach. And we sh also shouldn't pit mercy against excommunication necessarily um sometimes the medicine of mercy is excommunication sometimes that is the merciful thing to do and i'm not saying that excommunication is the only church form of church discipline that needs to be imposed right now uh not in all cases there's other measures of church discipline that can be taken against um priests who are not doing what they're supposed to do without resorting to excommunication although sometimes that's necessary um, but again, it, it boils down to a lack of church discipline that we've especially seen in the post-conciliar era. Not that we were perfect with it prior to, uh, Vatican II. I mean, <laughs> we, we've always struggled as a church with church discipline. Um, go back to the earliest days of Christianity. Church discipline was incredibly, incredibly harsh. You might do penance for 20 years for a sin before you receive communion. Um, we've slowly and slowly and slowly become more lax in discipline for 2000 years from that standard, which admittedly was on the other extreme. We've slowly become more and more laxed after 2000 years to the point that we're at now the other extreme where we just don't have church discipline. It's, it's like, can, can we find a nice happy medium here, please? <laughs> I'm not saying we need to return to the penitential system of the fourth century, but I am saying uh, that we might need to actually the, the third century it became a little bit more lax in the fourth century, but I'm not saying we need to return to that. But do we really have to go to the other extreme where we just don't have anything? Obviously, I'm being a little rhetorical sometimes that there, there is church discipline being imposed, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, so TLM Catholics are not just concerned about the mass. It's also the synod, what is happening in Germany with the blessing of same sex unions. Well, we're all concerned about that. The question is, what is the proper solution? And so we all have the same concerns. My question is, is this the right solution? What we're, what we've seen from Kwasniewski and, and others? No, it's not the right solution. Um, so how about we have those concerns and we address those concerns, but we address them in a way that doesn't make the situation worse and also doesn't then um, bring people into dissent, as I'm seeing some people on social media calling for. Um, hmm. Look it through the chat. So. If I recall correctly, Pope Benedict XVI hoped in Sumor and Pontificum that the extraordinary form would change or make the ordinary form more reverent, especially in churches where both were celebrated. That was the hope, and I think that that's, that's a good approach. That's a good approach. Um, it seems in Traditionis Custodis that Pope Francis thinks that that has failed. He does re refer to Sumor and Pontificum. Um, he says, with the passage of 13 years, let me share my screen. With the passage of 13 years, I instructed the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith to circulate a questionnaire to the bishops regarding the implementation of the motu proprio sumorum pontificum. Uh, some people have raised some fair concerns here about what was the questionnaire, who all received it, what, was, what, what all was the feedback. 
The responses reveal a situation that preoccupies and saddens me and persuades me of the need to intervene. Regrettably, the pastoral objection of my predecessor, that is Benedict XVI, who had intended to do everything possible to ensure that all those who truly possess the desire for unity would find it possible to remain in this unity or to rediscover it anew, has often been seriously disregarded. An opportunity offered by John Paul II and even with greater magnanimity by Benedict XVI intended to recover the unity of ecclesial of an ecclesial body with diverse liturgical sensibilities was exploited to widen the gaps, reinforce the divergence divergences and encourage disagreements that injure the church, block her path and expose her to the peril of division. So what he's saying is Benedict XVI's prudential decision here has failed. And what's happened is it's gotten worse. Why is it that we're making and proving him right? Why is it we're doing that? We're just proving him right with the kind of behavior we, that we've saw today. And a lot of it that we see on social media. We're just proving them right. Why isn't it that we're going to prove him wrong and say, you know what, Holy Father, I think that you're wrong here. Um, and I think that there is still further benefit to the approach that Benedict took. And we're not going to confirm you whenever you think that this is reinforcing uh, divergences and widening the gap. We're, we're going to prove you wrong. And we're going to show you that we're loyal sons of the church who are obedient to lawful authority and we're respectful and charitable, but we're going to continue to make our desires and, and, and our needs known. Why aren't we doing that? We just are confirming Pope Francis's assessment. It's sad. Um, hmm, where did you get your prayer rope? Did I, you make it? No, I did not. It's incredibly hard to make these kinds of prayer ropes as i understand it the way the knots are tied it's incredibly hard to do uh where did i get this one amazon i which is unfor Ugh. all right don't get me started but let me just go on my little rant here I, I like these because they're easily easy to get to from uh get from amazon but they do fall apart pretty quickly the bottom tassel falls uh apart pretty quickly so beware if you, if you do get it from amazon be aware of that uh although i did also have a gentleman who made one for me that has held up pretty good so far and i, I still use that it's in the house though i have them usually at different places <laughs> so <laughs> um let's look through the chat hmm What do you think of how there are less than 42,000 nuns left in the U.S.? What's the best solution to fix this? I mean, I, I don't know if that's true as far as the statistics there, but I'll assume for the moment that it's true. Um, what's the best solution to inspire people to the religious life, to show them why the religious life is beneficial? Are we really doing that? I don't know. I've seen a lot of religious who don't inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just be frank. They don't inspire me to live a life of sanctity and holiness. They look no different than the world. I'm not saying that there aren't religious um, uh, movements in the church that aren't to engage the world, but they also shouldn't act and look like the world. Uh, they should be calling us to something otherworldly. That would inspire us. Um. I just don't get that impression from a lot of the religious orders that I see today. They're, they're not inspiring me to um, dig deeper into the faith. They're not inspiring me to live a holier life. It, I think, however, if we return to our roots and we start doing those things, it's going to make a lot of people inspired to be part of the religious. Um. Let's see. What is wrong with the Novus Ordo, even if it's reverent? So here's some of the concerns that I have with the Novus Ordo as it's officially promulgated. I think some of the readings that were removed should be restored. Some of the more difficult scripture readings that were removed need to be brought back into the liturgical life. That's a huge, huge one. Also, I know that the rubrics allow for um, versus populum, I think that that should be removed. Um, I, I think that it should be required to do at Orientum. I, I don't think that versus populum, I don't think it has brought about what we thought it was going to bring about. I think it's probably brought about the opposite. So it might be time to reverse that one. 
those are just a couple examples there's more um so logos project says sumorum has failed because trads have been radicalized by the pope sumorum pontificum would have helped trads drop their schismatic attitude but the attitude is there and francis has brought it to light it's there among some not all um i consider myself a triad <laughs> because i mean it, anybody who's a faithful catholic is a traditionalist uh, that is not the same as a radical traditionalist so obviously we have to define our terms but i know what you mean there there are certain people who are in the trad movement that are confirming pope francis in his assessment again that's unfortunate and it's those people that he's talking about when he speaks of pharisees it's those people not people who just appreciate the tlm that's not the people he's talking about He's talking about the schismatic um, individuals that are found frequenting the TLM. That's who he's referring to. And you know what? He's right. He's right about them. I do see a lot of pharisaical um, attitudes among them. So how about we prove Pope Francis wrong instead of right? How about we take the path of holiness and sanctity? Uh, perhaps we should imitate people like Padre Pio. Whenever they suffered um, at the hands of the clergy... How about we take his approach rather than the approach of Martin Luther? Just a thought. Um, hmm. My concern with the Novus Ordo is the offertory. Um, I don't know why that would be a concern, just given the history behind it. So uh, maybe you're referring to abuses of it. I don't know. Uh, but it, it's it's properly done. It's it's very very traditional. Mm. Oh, I agree with you here. I also think the Eucharistic prayer should be reduced to the single Roman canon. I completely agree, wholeheartedly. Roman canon, <laughs> no question. It's not that the other canons are bad. I just don't think that it's fitting given how long we've used the Roman canon in the Roman rite. I just don't think it's fitting to use any other canon at this point. And I do want to say it's it's kind of the heart of of the liturgy, you know. So whenever you're not using the Roman rite, I'm sorry, the Roman canon, I don't think that you're using something different than the Roman rite, but I, I just want to say the Roman canon, canon number one right now. Uh, but what we just traditionally call the Roman canon, that really exemplifies the Roman rite. It, I mean, if you think of the Roman rite, you usually are going to think of the canon, and rightly so. And so to use a different canon, I understand there might be some benefits to use another canon, but I'm not sure that they outweigh the... Uh, the arguments that would say let's just stick to canon number one <laughs> let's just stick to get the roman canon maybe also restore uh some of the phrases in it because obviously the roman canon that we have now is a truncated version um not that the roman canon we had in the tridentine mass is the original gregory the great unfortunately truncated it in his papacy um but you know what i'd be satisfied with us just going to the roman canon um, the more extended form that we see in the Tridentine liturgy. Um, it, it's, it's Again, I think it's unfortunate that we're not doing the Roman canon. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, what else here? Um, one main issue with the trad movement is an elitist attitude that they will save the church. That's not how it works. Well, that's what pope francis is criticizing and so why are we confirming him because again there's a lot of people that are confirming him in his assessment stop confirming him stop confirming the bishops show the bishops that you're holy show the bishops that you're a loyal son or daughter of the church don't show them that you're a schismatic don't show them that you have hate in your heart I mean, I've, I've been guilty of all these things. I've been guilty of schismatic attitudes, hate in my heart, all of that. So I'm not just criticizing people as if I'm not guilty of the same thing. I'm guilty of the same thing. And I can tell you from experience, it's not the right path. It's not the way you want to go. It leads to a very, very dark place spiritually. I, again, I can tell you that from experience. 
uh, by God's grace, I, I'm trying to fight against it. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes it's hard not to be bitter. Sometimes it's hard not to be unrighteously angry. Now we can be righteously angry, but again, I think a lot of it sometimes turns into unrighteous anger. And I've been guilty of that. And once again, I can say that's not the way. It's not the way. Uh, let's see what else we got in the chat. Um, so somebody's asking, didn't, didn't Pope Francis provoke this attitude even further? Um, I don't think that he provoked it with Traditionis Custodis. I don't think he provoked it. I think that he's shedding light on it. And what's sad to me is we're proving him right. Let's prove him wrong. Show the Holy Father he's made a, a, a bad assessment of people in the TLM community. Show him that he's wrong. That will speak volumes to him. Um, okay, so Michael is mixing up the Archdiocese of Washington and its neighboring Diocese of Arlington. Ar the Archdiocese of Washington will be reduced to a total of three TLMs. Arlington uh, will have eight. It's not I who am doing that. I was reading that from Kwasniewski. Uh, so the numbers that I'm going from... Um, well, did did I misread his tweet then? Is that what you're saying? Let me let me go back and look. Hold on. Maybe you're saying I misread his tweet. If that's the case, okay. Let's let me stand corrected. Hold on. Uh, let me pull it up here. Let's see here. Because I think what you're saying is I misread him. Okay, pull it up, pull it up, let's see. <laughs> um, okay, I see what you're saying. Let me let me share my screen. Let me share my screen. Okay. Boom. So I think you're saying the Diocese of Arlington is the one that's being reduced. Got it. And I think I got confused because here we're talking about um, Wilton Gregory, and then we have a shift to the Arlington uh, Diocese. So I guess this right here is in reference to the Arlington Diocese. Yeah. So the, the eight parishes, um, let's see. Yeah, eight locations is in reference to Diocese of Arlington. And then you're saying that what the other commenter said about three parishes is correct in reference to um, Washington. Fair enough. Fair enough. I stand corrected. Um, it's unfortunate if there's any reduction, in my opinion. Um, but my concern is let's not let's not back them up in their fears of people in the TLM community. But yeah, certainly I, I, I stand corrected there. I apologize for the, the misunderstanding on my part. Again, I think any kind of restriction here is, is moving in the wrong direction because I think that um, what Benedict was arguing for, that there would be a mutual enrichment between the two forms in the Roman Rite, I think would still be more applicable to today and probably the best way to continue to move forward. In other words, I think that Sumorum Pontificum I don't think it's ran out of gas like Pope Francis thinks. I think that's probably what we need to continue with, with, ju with just some minor modifications, uh, perhaps, to address people who do have a schismatic mentality. Um, and then the other thing is, again, fix the problems in the Novus Ordo, and most of this will disappear overnight. Um, okay, let's see. <laughs> Um, thanks again for your content. I was in that dark place mixed in with rad and trad confusion. Your videos helped humble myself and pull me out of that. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, let's see, how do we convince our bishops about them being wrong when most of them are gay and have no shepherds like, uh, care for us? Well, aren't, aren't you proving their point with that comment? Uh, do you really know that that's how they are? what you say may be true, what you say may not be true. Um, but aren't you going to confirm them in their fears when you make comments like that? 
Um, and moreover, my thing is, what is the proper response to a bad bishop? Let's say you're true in, in what you said there. What's the proper response is what I'm saying. Is it the what we're seeing here from Kwasniewski? I don't think so. So even if what you're saying is true, is this how we respond to them? Is this how we respond to, um, you know, bishops that are, are failing in their ministry? I don't think so. Um, let's see. Uh, looking through here. Mm -hmm. Detraction and calumny uh, sounds sounds like there may be an element in that comment. Yeah, there there may be an element of detraction and calumny there. I, I would I would stay away from making comments like that. Uh, Sean, I know you're a loyal follower of the show. I appreciate that, but I think that taking that approach is the wrong approach. You're you're just again going to prove them right in their fears. Um, even if what you're saying is true, is that the approach we need to take? I don't think so. Um, let's see. Mm. Anything else in the comment section? Even some Eastern liturgies have been Westernized and they lost some of their traditions and have been done irreverently. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, some of them have been westernized, and they shouldn't have been westernized. And um, there's certainly a problem with a lack of reverence among some of the Eastern liturgies. Not all. Not all. Uh, there's some priests in the Eastern churches that celebrate the liturgies wonderfully. Um, but then I've seen some other stuff that I just, I kind of have to cringe. Um, hmm. Reason in theology, he was being sarcastic. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps Sean was being sarcastic. And if that's the case, okay. But I don't know if people are going to know that you're being sarcastic. I sure don't know that. So I would leave those kinds of comments, even if they're made sarcastically, leave it out because people might not read it that way, such as myself. Um, let's see. Um, do I have any videos about the Cyril Malabar churches in India? Not yet, although I'm open to having some, especially a guest that can come on and talk about them. So I hear some say that the Chaldean Mass today is just Novus Ordo done in Aramaic. I've seen some Chaldean Masses like that. I've, I've seen some. Um, maybe some work can be done there. Um, you can't blame TLM Catholics for being upset. Many lost their parishes. They've been attending for years. But I don't think that that's the criticism, my friend. I don't think anybody is criticizing... Uh, people being upset for losing a parish. Uh, I'm certainly not taking that position. I think that one should be upset. My concern is how do we respond to those things? And how do we deal with that emotion of being upset? That's my concern. It's not the emotions that people are feeling that I'm criticizing. I'm concerned about the way we respond to those emotions. Please don't confuse the two. Uh, what else? Hmm. Would you drive an hour away to go to a Byzantine parish? My friend, I drive four and a half hours. What are you talking about? Uh, what else? And four and a half hours one way, by the way. Uh, let's see. What should we do if the extraordinary form is banned completely? Well, I don't think it's going to be banned completely. Pope Francis certainly doesn't have the approach of banning it completely. 
Um, but if it's banned completely right now in the context where the Novus Ordo isn't being done bad, I think we really need to make our needs known to our shepherds. I don't think we should go into dissent. I don't think we should start holding liturgies um, against the will of our bishop. That would be schismatic. Um, but we could continue to make our needs known. Now, if we were in a situation where the Roman Rite is being done properly, we can then consider the idea of traditionis custodis with bringing two forms into one. We can then consider that. But right now, are we at that point where the ordinary form is being celebrated properly in the majority of cases? No. So I think it might be premature to move move to a push of just reducing things to one form. Um. Hmm. Do you think that the term traditional Latin mass is an appropriate name for the extraordinary form? No, sometimes I use it just for shorthand, but I actually don't think it's appropriate. I think it's a misnomer. Um, the Tridentine liturgy, when we call it traditional Latin mass, it might give the impression of what I saw one commenter tell me yesterday, and that is that it's the way that the liturgy has been celebrated for 1900 years. And another commenter said for 1500 years. Friends, there was no Roman Rite in the first century. There was no TLM in the first century. The liturgy in Rome would have been very, very different than the TLM. And there also would not have been one unified way of celebrating it in Rome. That being said, the many elements of the Tridentine liturgy are very, very ancient. I mean, going back to, you know, 400s and maybe even a little bit prior um so there are there are certainly some aspects to the tridentine liturgy that are very ancient and and revered and i think should be preserved um that being said please don't think that the tlm fell out of the sky 1500 years ago from heaven it's it reminds me of the kjv only as we really think that paul spoke elizabethan english and and had the king james version of the bible it's that kind of naive ignorance is just it's just that. And and I think that that doesn't help the Tridentine movement when we use that kind of um, those kinds of ignorant comments. It, it makes it makes it look bad. It makes it look like we're uneducated and ignorant people, um, which is why if you think that the TLM is 1500 years old, my suggestion to you is please don't comment on social media about how old the TLM is. Hold off on that until you've studied the history of the Roman Rite. Um, now let's uh, let's move forward. Uh, see here. Sean says I was not trying to start detraction on bishops. Two hundred characters is not enough to explain. Yeah. Well, look, I understand. I, I'm sure your your intentions are good. I wouldn't take the approach that you took as far as the comments that you used. I don't think they're helpful, but I understand. Um, let's see here. We are heading towards a complete extraordinary form ban. I agree. The right response is obedience and seeking out the most reverent Novus Ordo or divine liturgy, but you underestimate the ideological opposition to the TLM. I don't think I underestimate anything. I, what I am doing is I'm saying I have confidence in God and I have confidence in the path of holiness and sanctity. I have confidence in that. And I think you're underestimating the approach of the saints and you're underestimating the impact that sanctity can have on, um, you know, bishops who might not have, uh, the right perspective here. So I think you're the one underestimating some things here. I, I recognize very well ideologies that are present here on both sides, on both sides, because there's ideologies among the liberals and there's ideologies among the traditionalists as well. Um, but I think that you're right in, in the sense that if we continue to use the approaches that we've seen in the video today, among others on social media that are very common, if we continue to use that approach, I think you're right. We are moving towards a complete extraordinary form ban. So how about we don't go that direction? And how about we prove the bishop's wrong? How about we prove Pope Francis wrong? Um, what else? Um, wasn't the TLM data back to the Council of Trent? Not exactly. I mean, the, the Tridentine liturgy 
was not formed at the Council of Trent. It was already being celebrated with, like that in Rome prior to uh, Trent. Trent did not really change anything to the Roman liturgy. Um, it had already been, again, well established for a long time. Again, I think that you need to look into the history of the Roman liturgy. Maybe start with Fortescue as just a basic primer. Um, before Trent, there were multiple Western rites. Yes, yes, and there, there still are today. They they certainly have been reduced, and Quo Primum certainly did reduce some of them. And I'm not just talking about the ones that were less than 200 years old that it refers to. Also, some of the ancient ones, it did end up replacing some of those, which is unfortunate. Um, but... I, I but I but I don't want to say that the Tridentine liturgy is is dated to the time of the Tridentine fathers. It was at that time that we can see it was promulgated um, you know, in a more expanded way. But it's it's not that that was it was formed then and its elements don't predate the Council of Trent. That that's certainly not true. If, the, if that's what you're saying. Um, many of the elements of the Tridentine liturgy predate uh, Trent by centuries. Um, what are you talking about, Michael? The TLM is in the first century was celebrated using the red letter King James Bible. I mean, this is, the, again, the approach that a lot of us tend to take, and it's, it's very discouraging to see. Um... There was no Nova, Nova Sordo in the first century. I never claimed that there was. <laughs> I never said that there was. So uh, I, I don't know who that's in reference to. <laughs> um, there was just some very basic elements to the liturgies, but they tended to be pretty diverse, and they were also very much attached to our Jewish roots back in the first century. Um, so there wasn't a uniform liturgy in the first century. It wasn't just celebrated in one particular way. There wasn't, you know, particular rubrics or something like that. There wasn't even set prayers in many cases, not that you wouldn't have any set prayers, but they generally would have been derived from, again, our Jewish roots. If, if there were any, uh, <laughs> Michael Vofton uh, or Michael Mofton celebrates extraordinary form versus populum. That's funny. <laughs> Have I ever attended a Dominican Rite Mass? No, but I've seen them online, but I've never attended one. I'd love to, but just haven't had the opportunity. Um, hmm. So maybe it will take too long, but can you explain why priests like Padre Pio and others that were allowed to use the 62 missile and indult 62 missile masses? Uh, although I think that that's not entirely true. There, there were some aspects that were uh, being reformed even in Padre Pio's day prior to Paul VI promulgation of the missile and Padre Pio acquiesced to them, uh, such as versus populum among some other changes to his liturgy. Um, and he did not like the changes, but he did celebrate them in obedience to the church. Um, but there, there's some general truth to what you're saying. And I think it's because some of these um, priests were so old, it was very difficult for them to start, you know, learning a, new, a, a, a newer way in which the liturgy is expressed with different words and stuff like that. I mean, it was just, it, it, would, it would be pretty difficult. And, it, and in fact, it was difficult for Padre Pio. Um, mm, worship doesn't come out of thin air except perhaps a Novus Ordo. That's a, that's a funny joke. Um, not entirely true, but there's, there's a grain of truth to it. <laughs> the Roman canon is probably used less than 1% of the time. I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's, it's rare and that's unfortunate. I think the Roman canon should be the majority. That's very unfortunate. And, and again, a Roman canon that is more expanded than the one we currently have in the extraordinary form. I'm sorry, ordinary form. Um, is the ordinary form of the mass the equivalent of a TLM set in English? No, it's not. But I could see how you might 
get that impression. But it, there, there are some differences, of course. Okay. Eucharistic prayer number two is the most used from my experiences. Mine as well. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that the other forms are, are bad. I'm just saying, might it be most fitting to use Canon one? Um, since that would be more in continuity with the way the Roman rite has been celebrated for a very long standing period of time. I think so. Isn't it better to preserve that continuity rather than to have some rupture there? Yeah. So what good reason do we have for other Eucharistic forms? And any answer that I've seen for that, I don't think are, are good enough. So. Uh, okay. Uh, your boy EB says, you're my favorite Catholic YouTuber and commentator. Very balanced, and you show very much prudence and wisdom. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. I appreciate it. If if any of that is true, it would only be by God's grace. <laughs> because, again, I, I have the very same reaction that most people have, and that is to want to say things that are uncharitable. I mean, I have the same disposition. Um, but I, I guess we have to work on that to not prove people right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. um, the ordinary it has pretty sweet system for distributing communion under both species yeah yeah i mean i i really like the way the ordinary it is celebrated um if the novus ordo could just be the way that the ordinary it is celebrated again the majority of people who have criticisms with the novus ordo would disappear overnight it just would um Let's see. Eucharistic prayer too is weak. It's just bare bones. Roman canon is like a full course meal, Roman Catholic theology and worship. I think there's some truth that the Roman canon is, is fuller uh, than that. Now, let's, let's be fair. Um, early Eucharistic prayers, even, well, I mean, there was a time when there wasn't any kind of uniform Eucharistic prayer. It was just basically whatever the celebrant came up with. Uh, on the on the spot effectively but you know kind of early on we started getting um, written versions of the eucharistic prayers that started to be celebrated uniformly in particular territories and um you know some of them were maybe not as full in their theology as we would like um some of them were also pretty long <laughs> So <laughs> there's a give and take there, but I think there's some truth to what you're saying. Uh, thank you for the super chat. The way I see it, if God wills the growth of the TLM, then it will grow. If not, then perhaps I need to change and accept God's will in whatever liturgy he ultimately wishes me to attend. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think there's um, there's truth to what you're saying. Um, I think at the end of the day, we, we have to trust God and his providence. That doesn't mean you can't make your needs known to your shepherds. You can and should. But I think it needs to be within the bounds of charity and the structure of the church. Um, so those who are calling us to celebrate illicit liturgies and disobedience to our bishops in hotel rooms and houses, um, that's not okay. That's schismatic, and that is very common among some popular speakers in the TLM community. And again, I think that all you're doing is you're proving the bishops right, that you have a schismatic mentality. You're just proving them right. You know, those who are back to the catacombs, back to celebrating liturgies and hotels, those people, you're proving the bishops right. Please stop that. That's not the right way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. To say Peter K is frustrating is an understatement. He's the definition of uh, trad gaslighting. I think that Peter Kwasniewski's um, positions are often very problematic and I don't think that he's offering us a good solution to the current crisis but I share his many of his concerns 
with the state of the church today, I share his concerns. I mean, I'm right there with him as far as I'm, I'm also concerned and even upset about some of the things that he's concerned and upset. You know, how, how do we respond to that? How do we approach and how do we deal with and how do we address the crisis in the church? That's where I would depart with Peter Kwasniewski. Uh, so, again, I, I think we all share the same concerns. Um, what's the solution, though? Let's let's offer a solution that, number one, is historically accurate, that's fair, uh, that's charitable, and is also consistent with the magisterium. That doesn't lead me to schism. That That's my position. Um, can you show examples of interventions in the TLM that weren't small changes? I, I gave you one. Gregory the Great significantly impacted and made some modifications to the Roman canon, among other things. Um, another one that's pretty big for me um, is... Um, withholding chrismation from infants um and then another big one is the change in um administration of communion on, under both kinds into one form i think it was necessary at the time in which this was done in the roman rite um but that's a pretty big change okay hmm Well, see, here's um, th this is this commenter right here kind of proves m my point in many ways. The commenter says, for all Eastern Rite Catholics, imagine if the Byzantine liturgy were just wiped out tomorrow via, via papal decree. This kind of rhetoric, this kind of misrepresentation, I don't find helpful. Um, the Pope has not obliterated the Roman rite. So this is not a fair analogy. Um, however, I have spoken about this scenario and I've spoken about the extent of papal authority on this. I've spoken about that. And my thing is I'm, I am just as consistent in calling Eastern Catholics to obedience to the papacy and the magisterium as I am to Roman rite Catholics and Latin rite Catholics. So number one, your your rhetorical comment is not even analogous to the current situation. Moreover, it doesn't change anything because I'm consistent across the board. I call Eastern Catholics to this same kind of obedience to the magisterium as I do Latin Rite Catholics. And there are some Eastern Catholics that are not being obedient to the magisterium. And I've done videos for that. And I call that out as well. So I'm consistent. Uh, there might be others who aren't consistent there, though. I don't know. Uh, what else? Mm. Look it through the chat. Mm. Um, Kwasniewski actively encourages people to call Francis formally heretical, then acts shocked when the Curia comes down on drats, all in the name of tradition, traditional popes, and would put the U.S. under interdict. Yeah, I mean, Kwasniewski has has called Pope Francis a formal heretic, and I've corrected him on that, and he still stands by it. Um, he also says some other things that are deeply troubling. So, again, that's that's my thing is uh, Kwasniewski and people who are along those lines, I think, are aggravating the problem in the church. We both share the same concerns about the crisis, but I think their solution makes the situation in the church worse, not better. And it's just proving Pope Francis and the bishops who have concerns about the TLM community, just proving them right. Uh, so that's where I depart with Kwasniewski, um, who who I, I, I also have concerns about an individual who's not trained in theology or liturgy making these kinds of claims. Um, that that's a huge concern because that's certainly a theological assessment and i just haven't seen enough awareness on his part on 
what it means to be a formal heretic and when you can call the Pope a formal heretic? Uh, mm, let's see here. Um, if you attend a Byzantine parish, can your t kids take communion or do they have to change rites? Kids below age of reason, that is. If your kids have been chrismated, yes. If they have not been, ordinarily, no. Because if you're part of the Roman rite, the Byzantine rite is going to say you need to respect the uh, discipline of your rite. Uh, so unless your kids have been chrismated, they would not receive communion, even though we tend, we generally in most Eastern Catholic churches communicate infants. Um, again, it's, it's a matter of respecting the discipline of your church. Um, okay. A layman judging a sitting Pope, There's certainly problems there in calling Pope Francis a formal heretic. Um, and then expressing that publicly. Um, once again, I question whether or not um, he's capable of making that assessment, let alone whether or not it should be expressed publicly in light of Donum Veritatis, among other things. Um, now, hmm. Ask your bishop for the restored order of sacraments during the synod on synodality. It's a good idea. I really think that Roman not right needs some work there. Um, can Roman Catholic adults communicate at the Byzantine right? Yes. Um, hmm. Is that everything? Let's see. I think that's pretty much it. I see a question about hybrid rights. Uh, is it possible for there to be a hybrid right combining all aspects of Latin and Byzantine right into one hybrid right? Is creating this possible for the Pope? I, why would we do that? <laughs> Let's preserve all of the rights of the church, is my thing. Preserve the Roman right, preserve the Byzantine rights, the non-Byzantine Eastern rights, pres preserve all the rights of the church. Uh, why, why do that? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily conflate them. I would say um, for the Roman right, don't start mixing other rights into it. Um, just simply be consistent with the history of that right. Um, now, is creating this possible for the Pope? I've done videos multiple times go to the magisterium playlist or the liturgy playlist i've done videos multiple times on the extent of papal authority when it comes to liturgies and discipline it's it's addressed by trent and vatican one um and and the responses that i've seen from kwasniewski notwithstanding they they don't sufficiently engage uh the content that i've presented on uh trent and vatican one in those areas in fact i think i did a response to him that he um, basically said he's going to dismiss and ignore. But you can go to, um, let's see, the name of the article is um, Is Traditionis Custodis an Abuse of Papal Authority? This is a article that I wrote in response to his uh, content and his claims about, uh, traditionis custodis. Um, I show some of the problems of his position here. Unfortunately, he has chosen not to engage it and to dismiss it. Um, and unfortunately he's also chosen, um, and declined multiple times to come on my show. So please don't ask me, have you invited him? Yes, I've invited him. Uh, he's, he's had, invitations for over three years now and i'm no longer offering because of the many times that he's rejected and most recently the last way in which he rejected it i think the offer is kind of revoked at this point um but that being said i still wish my brother well um i i wish you know 
that he will do the right thing. He'll take the right approach, take a different approach than what we're seeing here. I, you know, I, I only hope well for him and I, I hope to see better than what we're, we're seeing currently, because I think it's doing more harm to the church than, than good. And I want to encourage him and urge him to take a different way, a more charitable approach. We'll see if he does it though. All right. Appreciate y'all watching. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. Share this on your social media. Check me out also patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. See you later. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.